That'll be fun. So today we're honored to host Ken Pollack, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and one of the leading analysts in the U.S. Uh, and commentator on Middle Eastern political and military affairs. Ken is the author of nine books, shaming, shaming all of us, including most recently the widely acclaimed Unthinkable, colon, Iran, the Bomb, and American Strategy. And if you're still curious how the Intelligence Studies Project gets involved in all of this, I should make a special note of the fact that Ken began his professional life in Washington as a political military analyst with the Director of Intelligence at CIA. And then for some reason that he may explain to us, he left the virtuous world of intelligence analysis and signed up in the rough and tumble uh, world of policy making. He did that through a series of staff assignments at an important time at the National Security Council. Ken did his undergraduate work at Yale, earned a PhD in political science from MIT. So please join me in welcoming Ken Bollinger. Uh, the formal title of this talk is why is the Middle East so screwed up? Okay, give you a sense of where I'm coming from. And I think it's important both because so much of the country, so much of the world is struggling to try to understand what's going on, but also because it's very hard to think through what it is that you might be doing toward the Middle East to make it better if you don't understand what ails it. Now, I will also say that I'm delighted in the, in the questions and answers. I'm glad to field whatever you guys want to talk about. You want to talk about big picture stuff, like what I'm going to talk about in my remarks, that's great. But if you want to talk about you know, the day-to-day, the, -day, the kind of what's burning, uh, you, know, you want to talk about the Iranian nuclear agreement or the Kurdish referendum or you know, next steps in the war against Daesh, ISIS, uh, I'm glad to field any of those kinds of questions. But I said, what I thought I'd do with my prepared remarks is talk about how I see the region and hopefully give all of you some way of kind of getting your arms around what's going on in the Middle East. All right. Um, first thing I'll say is the Middle East is really bad right now. Um, as Steve pointed out, I've been working on the Middle East for 30 years. It's never been good, right? Um, you know, not in my lifetime, I don't think ever in my parents' lifetime. Uh, it's never been good, but it's never been this bad. Right? You have to go back a long ways. I was thinking about it for an article I wrote about a year ago, and I kind of had to go back to the Mongol invasions of the 13th century to come up with a time that was this bad in the Middle East. Right? It's really bad out there. And I would argue that there are four basic interlocking and sequential problems that have brought the Middle East to this state of affairs. Right? I'm going to start with what I'm going to leave off the left list, right? Not one of my four. But you hear it a lot right now, and that's the poor cartographic skills of Mr. Sykes and Monsieur Pico. Right? These are the two guys, the Brit and the Frenchman, who sat down in 1916 and came up with a very preliminary sketch of how the British and French were planning to divide up the Ottoman Empire. And you hear lots and lots of people, and it gets written about in our press all the time, basically blaming the problems of the Middle East on the map, right, on the map drawn by the British and French by and large after World War I. I don't think that's correct. Um, first, I've actually been through an exercise. In 2008, Vanity Fair asked myself, Dennis Ross, David Frumkin, the author of Peace to End All Peace, to sit down and they literally put us in a room and gave us a blank map of the Middle East and said, draw the lines, right? Draw the lines that you think make sense. And it was a really interesting exercise. We spent an afternoon together, and we came up with lines that kind of made sense. Who, you know, who was like who, who wasn't like who, and what, the, what that ought to look like. And it was an interesting exercise, but truth be told, the lines weren't terribly different from the lines that we actually have. Right? Those of you who are interested, they published it in the January 2008 edition of Vanity Fair, um, and it's noteworthy because everybody in the Middle East has a copy of this map, right? Because they are certain that this is the secret American plan for redoing the map of the Middle East, right? I'm endlessly confronted with this thing, right? And it's got all kinds of caveats about it, and you know, they don't care. Um, but it, just, it was an interesting exercise, and you know, what you find is, of course, that people have these ideas about natural states and artificial states, and the states of the Middle East are no more natural or artificial than any other set of states anywhere on Earth. Right? States are, by definition, artificial. 
right? And some of the Middle Eastern states are newer than most other states that we think about. Some of them are a lot older than those that we think about. And again, that's not really the problem. That's not what's driving the problems of the Middle East. I would say that the first problem starts not with the end of the First World War, but with the end of the Second World War. After the Second World War, pretty much all of the states of the Middle East gained full, real independence. Uh, most of them had some version of you know, farcical independence before that. Uh, but it really, after World War II, they gained full independence. And all of them, all the Arab states in Iran, build similar kinds of systems. Right? They are political autocracies. Uh, typically, we used to divide them up into two different types, monarchies and what we would euphemistically call republics, read military dictatorships. Right? And there were slight differences, but the differences really were quite slight. Right? The monarchies had some greater grounding in the people, they had some greater legitimacy, but not a whole lot. Right? It's worth keeping in mind that you know, a lot of Americans, when we think about monarchies, right, we think of like the British crown, right, going back centuries. Very, very few. Basically, only one Middle Eastern uh, monarchy predates the 20th century. Right, we need to remember, the Jordanian monarchy is established in 1921. The Saudi monarchy is, well, they get Saudi Arabia in 1932, right? Right on up to the UAE, right, where it was established in 1971. Right, so they don't really have the same longevity that we tend to ascribe to monarchies. And again, they have some greater degree of legitimacy for a variety of reasons, but not a whole lot. And politically, they are all autocracies. And of course, economically, they were what we call in the academic lingo, rentier states. Right? States that gained their wealth not from the work of their people, but from some outside source. Right? And in the Middle East, it has overwhelmingly been oil. Right? Either the countries of the region pumped it themselves, or they gained oil wealth typically from the other countries that did the pumping through combinations of aid, trade, and worker remittances. Right? And for much of that period also, they could then add on to its superpower margins. External aid from the United States and its allies, or while it was in existence, the Soviet Union and its allies, right? which also was ultimately in many ways about oil because that was the real superpower competition in the region and why we care so much about this part of the world. So at the end of the day, the vast majority of wealth, the revenues that sustained these regimes, had nothing to do with their people. Right? And that reinforced the autocracy because they didn't care about their people. They tended to regard their people as kind of mostly an unwanted set of dependents. Right? And the question was simply, how much do we have to pay them to buy them off? Right, and allow us to do what we want to do. And of course, they married this kind of combined autocratic rentier state economy with a very traditional social structure, one which you know, even in the 1940s and 50s was a little bit long in the tooth um, and a little bit out of step with where the rest of the world was headed, but increasingly over the course of time really became kind of a dinosaur. Right? Now, this system, which was adopted by basically all of the Arab states in Iran, worked okay for the first 30, 40, maybe 50 years. It was never great, right? It kind of clunked along, but it made its way until really the late 1980s, early 1990s, and since then, it has really started to break down. Right? And over the last 30 or so years, we have seen increasing degrees of internal unrest, efforts to form parties to compete with the political entity, even outright revolts of one kind or another, all culminating in the Arab Spring of 2011. <clears throat> and what's important to recognize about the Arab Spring of 2011 is that it affected pretty much every country in the region, right, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, the Saudis had surprisingly little. Glad to talk about you know, why I think that's the case if you want to. Um, but pretty much every state in the region had some degree of unrest, and typically more significant unrest than we had seen in the past. And obviously, we got full revolutions and regime change in five of those countries. Right? Stunning. But what the reason that it caught fire, and that, pardon me, was effectively a pun, right, given how it started in Tunisia, is because all of the people of the Arab world had the same set of grievances, which they have to this day. Right? They are tired 
they are frustrated and they are angry with this system which is no longer performing. Right? Again, it never performed great, but for the first 30, 40, 50 years it performed adequately. And there were other forces that kind of kept them all together and kept them moving forward and distracted them from their own circumstances. Beginning in the late 80s, that starts to break down, and by the time we get to 2011, all across the region, people are looking for something completely different. Now, 2011 obviously has a big impact in a lot of different ways. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about some of uh, the other ways that it affect. But obviously different regimes, the ones that survive, responded to it differently. Some responded with kind of fake reform efforts. Some responded by cracking down completely. Others kind of pretended that nothing happened, right, and tried to go about their merry business. Um, and some, in particular, bizarrely enough, Saudi Arabia, have actually recognized that, you know what, well, we're sitting on a powder keg. Our state system is breaking down, and we are going to have to change. Right? We're going to have to fundamentally shift. Right? And what the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who we call MBS, is proposing is a real reform program. Now, again, in the Q&A, glad to talk more about it. I don't know if it's going to work. Right? This is a, a very hard thing to do, and lots of other countries that have tried this have failed. But as I said, the Saudi experiment is just beginning, and it may not succeed. Right? And the Saudis are almost unique. You know, Jordan desperately needs the same kind of a program. Morocco desperately needs the same kind of a program. Right? Neither of those countries is investing in it in the same way that the Saudis have. The Omanis honestly need to do something like it. The Bahrainis need to do even more. Right? Very few countries so far are really following Saudi Arabia's lead, and as a result, those problems persist. The failure of the Arab state system is still there, it is still out there, it is still a very big problem in the region. And that's problem one, and that drives much of what is going on. Because every government in the region is acutely aware of the problem that its system is breaking down, that its people are deeply unhappy, and it is endlessly trying to guard against new outbreaks of internal unrest. And that is a prime, and I would argue the principal driver of all of their foreign policies, is how do we insulate ourselves and prevent foreign developments from causing new internal upheavals. The second problem of the Middle East now is a function of the first problem, and that is the outbreak of civil wars. As I said, you have five full-scale revolutions in 2011. Three of them led to civil wars. Syria, Libya, Yemen are all now in a state of civil war. Okay. Uh, we created the civil war in Iraq when we invaded and then put nothing in its place in 2003, although we had absolutely quelled the civil war by 2008-9, uh, but then of course we allowed it to re-emerge after we pulled our troops out, and we'll have to talk about that and why it happened, but it's also worth noting that, and this is kind of part of what I'm going to talk about with civil wars, a big, well, or at least an important element in pushing Iraq back into civil war was the outbreak of civil war in Syria. Right? And that's the real problem with the civil wars. Is civil wars are horrific for the people living in those countries, but we need to care about them because they generate spillover. Right? They generate uh, very dangerous problems for the countries who neighbor them. Um, I'm not going to turn this into an academic lecture. I've got a great lecture on spillover in civil wars. Um, I will simply say that there are six forms of spillover from civil wars. You find them in every civil war, although they can range from kind of the mildly annoying to the truly catastrophic. Right, and those six, and you'll recognize them immediately in the Middle Eastern conflicts when I start talking about them, those six are refugees, terrorism, secessionism, radicalization of neighboring populations, economic dislocation, and neighboring interventions. Right? And the civil wars in Libya, Syria, uh, Yemen, and Iraq on top of that, which was helped push back into civil war uh, by the other three, are generating all those forms of spillover. Right? And we've seen you know, all kinds of problems. You know, uh, I can remember I started writing about the civil war in Syria in 2012. In 2012, the argument I was making was 
Syria could be a real problem because of the threat of spillover, right? We don't really have any interest in Syria per se. The problem is what it could do to the rest of the region. You know, it's 2012, I knew the country was very tired of its Middle East engagement, so I said, you know, we can try to contain the Syrian civil war. Might work, never really has historically, but who knows, maybe this time around, we'll, you know, we can always be the first. Um, but it may not work, right? Probably won't, and if that happens, we're going to need to deal with it. Um, and I remember at that time thinking, you know, if the spillover from Syria got really bad, it could potentially affect Europe. And I debated, should I actually write that? And I said, no, I shouldn't, because I would sound like such a crazy alarmist saying that the Syrian civil war could somehow affect Europe. Then Brexit happened, right? And I found myself thinking, you know, even you know, at my most extreme, I never could have predicted that the spillover from Syria and Libya, by the way, the refugees, the terrorism in particular, would wind up causing or helping to cause the British to pull out of the European Union. Right? But that's the problem with these civil wars. They are unbelievably unpredictable. <laughs> Things that you never, ever thought would happen, absent a civil war, civil war comes along and it just happens. Right? I never thought the Saudis were going to intervene in Yemen. Right? send their, their air force and eventually parts of their army into Yemen. That was absolutely unimaginable. They're doing it. Right? We're past the second anniversary of the Saudi intervention in Yemen. It is what these civil wars do. Right? We now have a proto-civil war raging in southeastern Turkey. We now have a proto-civil war raging in the Sinai. There are problems in the western desert of Egypt. Again, this is very commonplace for civil wars. They have a bad habit of spreading. They don't stay contained within their borders. And a great deal of the problems of the region right now, you could say they ultimately stem from the failure of the Arab state structure, but because the Arab the failure of the Arab state structure created, gave rise to these civil wars. The civil wars are now adding to that, right? And they are, by themselves, engines of instability that are adding to the problems of the region. So that's the second. The third one is, in many ways, a byproduct of the civil war, or the civil wars. And that is the rise of a Sunni-Shia war across the Middle East. Right, now, this is another one that needs a little bit of unpacking, right? Because, again, there's just this terrible literature in the Western press and kind of the, the popular writing about the Middle East that this is ancient hatreds and it goes back hundreds of thousands of years and they've always hated each other, they've always been killing each other. No! And that is absolutely wrong. Um, we have a very bad habit of analogizing the Sunni Shia split with the Catholic Protestant split of Europe. And the simple fact is that while there's been tension, and there certainly have been some fights and other problems between Sunni and Shia dating back to the death of the Prophet Muhammad, their relationship has never been like the Catholic-Protestant split in Europe. Right? You can't find a 30 years war in Islamic history. Right? They don't have the wars of the Reformation. They don't have a Spanish Inquisition. And again, there have been periods of tension but especially when you got into the later 20th century, their relationship was actually pretty good. And in most of the countries of the Middle East where you had large intermingled Sunni and Shia populations, they got along really well. Right? In places like Iraq and Kuwait, and to a certain extent Bahrain, not Saudi Arabia because the Saudis have their own issues, right? but in all those other places, Sunni and Shia would worship in each other's mosques. There was very high degrees of intermarriage. Um, when we invaded Iraq in 2003, the population of Baghdad, remember Baghdad is a quarter of the population of Iraq, the population of Baghdad was 40% either in a mixed marriage or the product of a mixed marriage. Right? I can't tell you how many Iraqi friends I have who call themselves Sushis. <laughs> <laughs> They're half Sunni and half Shia. Right? There are just tons and tons of them. Now, all that said, what happens in civil wars, and this is a very common phenomenon, right, and it's not about religion, right, but what we've seen all across the world, by the way, you know, since I'm at UT, and I have a PhD, I can say this, right, there is a phenomenal body of academic work on civil wars, 
Right? For 30, 40 years, you've had a whole group of scholars all across the country who've just been digging into 100 years of literature on civil wars, or 100 years of history, on about 150 different civil wars. And the, the stuff that these people have done is superb. Right? It's all mutually complementary and reinforcing, and they've actually come up with you know, patterns and how, they, how civil wars end. It is a really remarkable literature. And one of the things that they have demonstrated over and over again is that once you remove the top level, the national level leadership, right, so you open up the security vacuum, the state either collapses or is badly weakened, opening up a security vacuum, people are forced to look to sub-national identities for security. Right? Now, in most cases, they do this slowly and they do it unwillingly. Nobody suddenly just rushes out and says, you know, oh my God, I was a Yugoslav today, or yesterday, now I'm a Serbian today. Right? Most of them it takes a lot of time because they don't want to move in that direction. But the anarchy creates fear, and that fear gets reinforced by a group of people that seems ubiquitous to these kinds of wars, um, vicious thugs who try to take advantage of the anarchy to make themselves powerful by stirring the intercommunal hatred. Right? So whether it's somebody like Arkan in Bosnia or Muqtada Sadr in Iraq, or uh, Zarqawi in Iraq, right? you get these people who look at it and say, civil war is good for me. Right? Maybe bad for my country, if there is still a country. Maybe bad for my people, but it's good for me. Right? Because I can become a leader of my people. And the way I'm going to become a leader is I'm going to go and attack the other identity group. Because that will get them to attack my identity group. And when my identity group fears, feels frightened, they will rally around people like me. Right? And you see it in every one of these civil wars, and unfortunately, it works. Right? That is why people like Muqtad al-Sadr emerge um, and become important leaders. Right? So they stoke this kind of violence and fear. And in a number of places in the Middle East, and I'm using those words very carefully, the clear ident subnational identity group was religious, was Sunni versus Shia. Right? And that was reinforced by geography, in some cases even by ethnicity. Right? And so it made it clear that this was the obvious thing to do. And what's more, you do have these Salafi jihadists out there, these rabid Sunnis, and a few rabid Shia out there as well, who've always believed in this stuff and always wanted to go in this direction. And the anarchy, the, the security vacuum, just created a wonderful opportunity for them to kind of ply their trade. And so what you saw in a lot of these countries was places where there really wasn't a very severe Sunni-Shia split, um, where may have been some tension or some disagreements, but also lots of agreement, they come apart completely. Right? And part of that is also this radicalization of neighboring states that I was talking about, which is another very common feature of civil wars, where people in neighboring states embrace the problems of the civil war. And it's typically, you know, there's some common affinity, there's another ethnic or religious or racial group in that country that you feel a closeness to, or a historical tie or something else, but you wind up embracing that. And this is what we've seen in Iraq, in Syria, and in Yemen, right, where you've had, and again, the civil wars have been very complex, but in each you've had Sunnis and Shia fighting each other. And you've had people trying to rally around these religious banners. And the people in other countries have embraced those causes. Right? Worth keeping in mind, you know, most people think about the unrest in Bahrain, and they assume it's something that started with the Arab Spring in 2011. And it certainly did revive in 2011. But in 2006, 7, 8, 9, you had very severe riots in Bahrain. Right, and martial law imposed in Bahrain, because the Shia of Bahrain, who are the majority, saw their Iraqi brethren battling for control of Iraq and being given control of Iraq. And their response was, why can't we have that too? Right? Why can't we get the same treatment here in Bahrain? Another very common manifestation of this, this set of problems. Right? And so as a result, this opening up of these civil wars in particular in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, created this Sunni-Shia tension, which is now spreading all across the region. 
And the last piece of it, of course, it's got to be brought up, is the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. Now, there is a religious component of the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. There is also an ethnic component of the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. Uh, you can talk to plenty of Saudis, and they will use the words Iranian, Persian, and Shia interchangeably. Right? In the same sentence, they will use all three of them. They can be talking about an Iraqi Arab and they will call him or her a Persian or an Iranian, because they don't distinguish, right? It's all the same thing. And they hate the Iranians for being Persians at least as much, I would actually argue even more, than they hate the Iranians for being Shia. And that rivalry, these two great powers in the Middle East, both of whom believe they ought to be the leader, whatever the hell that means, of this part of the world, are also competing. Right? And it, too, has reinforced the sunni narrative. Now, one last point on that before I move on to the fourth point. <clears throat> it's worth noting, the Iranians make the point that it's really the Saudis' fault. Now, that's an exaggeration, but they're not completely wrong. Right? Because both the Saudis and the Iranians know two important demographic facts. Right? Fact one is, there are 30 million Saudis and 80 million Iranians. Right? And the Saudis also know their population, not terribly dynamic, not terribly good at this whole fighting thing. Iranians, much more dynamic, pretty good at this whole fighting thing. Right? So if it's a Saudi-Iran fight, the Saudis are on the short end of the stick. Right? They've got real problems taking on the Iranians by themselves, even with their allies who don't add a whole lot to them with the exception of one very important element. <laughs> the other demographic fact that they all know is that out of the 1.4 billion Muslims in the world, 85% of them are Sunnis. Right? So if this is a, a Saudi-Iran fight, which is what the Iranians want, Iran has the upper hand. If this is a Sunni-Shia fight, which is what the Saudis want, the Saudis have the upper hand. Right? And so the Saudis have deliberately stoked this narrative of this being a broader Sunni-Shia clash so that they will gain that advantage. And the problem in all these instances, it all becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? I can remember in 2004 when King Abdullah of Jordan warned of a Shia crescent arising in the Middle East. And this was ridiculous when he said it. I remember thinking, this is complete nonsense. And I remember thinking, boy, we and they would have to really screw things up for there ever to be a Shia crescent. But guess what? There's a Shia crescent, right? Syria is increasingly dominated once again by the, the Shia. Lebanon is wholly dominated by Hezbollah. You've got Iran, and Iraq is still in play, but the Iranians are the most influential foreign power in Iraq. And who knows what we're going to do after the defeat of ISIS, right? We may hand Iraq right back to the Iranians. And that, too, plays exactly to the fears of the Sunnis. That's what they were afraid of all along. And they look at what's happening and say, see, we warned you, we told you that this was going to happen. And the fact that people like me can say, but you guys made this happen, right? You engineered it. It never had to be this way. Doesn't matter. That's where we are. So that's the third problem. This is increasing Sunni Shia split and division and all the problems that it's created all across the region. And then the last problem has been the disengagement of the United States. Now, I don't know what you guys think of President Obama. Um, you know, I can go either way on him. I think he did good things. I think he did bad things. But in my little, you know, pond, my little part of the world, his policies were very problematic. Right? Think of it this way. The Middle East, the Arab states in particular, for 500 years have been under the domination of some external power. Right? For 400 of those years, it was the Ottomans. Then it was followed by most of the British. We can throw in the French, too, but they were really only in Syria and Lebanon. And then when the British finally punted in 1971, we took over. Right? The Middle East, the Arab states in particular, have never been without, you know, their lifetimes, the past half millennia, have never been without that external great power right, to help them order their interactions. Right? And when we started to pull back, it terrifying. Right? President Obama's belief, and he used to say this all the time at the beginning of his administration, worth noting, he stopped saying it halfway through because he realized it wasn't true. He kept insisting, if we're not there, the Arab states will have to do the right thing because the alternative is total chaos. 
guess what? <laughs> at every, exactly. At every single step, they did the wrong thing. They did the worst thing, right? Because they acted out of fear. And their response when they feel afraid is typically to overreact and to lash out. Right? They tend to exaggerate threats. They do not have capabilities that we have. They try to do things for bad reasons in ways that they simply can't accomplish. Right? And exhibit A there is once again the Saudi intervention in Yemen. Right? They greatly exaggerated the Iranian role in Yemen. They greatly exaggerated the threat from Yemen to their own internal stability. Going back to my point number one. And they chose to intervene in a way that they simply could not accomplish. They do not have the military power to end that war the way that we effectively did in Iraq during the surge. Right? And instead, they got themselves stuck. Right? And we see other examples of that all around the region. Right? But this absence of the United States has opened up space, and let's also recognize the other side, to allow the Iranians to do all kinds of stuff right, that they otherwise would not have been able to. Um, you know, again, I don't want to paint the Iranians as 10 feet tall. They are not. The Iranians have never successfully started a civil war. They have never successfully started an insurgency. But what they do is they go looking for problems and, you know, looking for cracks in Middle Eastern walls, and then they stick their claws in and try to pry them apart. And there are lots and lots of fissures all over the Middle East and lots of civil wars and insurgencies which the Iranians have been able to come into and make great hay out of them. And again, our absence has allowed that, and that has further inflamed, infuriated, and terrified our allies who keep overreacting, right, because we're not there. All right, so those are the four basic problems of the Middle East. Um, I'm going to wrap up, but before I wrap up, what I would say to you is, this framework, and you know, if you buy my logic, and I obviously do, right? Um, if you want to think about what we should be doing, if you want to think about what would need to happen to actually make the Middle East better, it's simply about unraveling these four problems. Right? So you start with American engagement. Right? We've got to re-engage. And you know, here, what I hear from the Trump administration, it ain't going to work. Right? The idea that we're just going to blow ISIS to smithereens, hand Syria to the Iranians and Russians, walk away, maybe do some more bombing in Yemen, this is not the kind of engagement that is needed. Right? This is not the kind of effort that is going to reassure our allies, get them to stop overreacting, push the Iranians back, prevent them from continuing to expand their influence and uh, aggressive designs across the region. Right? There are obviously lots of other ways to do things. I'm glad in the Q&A talk about it if you want to, but it starts with a constructive American engagement about reassuring our allies, pushing back on the Iranians, but then also dealing with the other sets of problems. Right? Pushing back on the Iranians and reassuring our allies would go a long way to healing the Sunni Shia rift. At the very least, it would go a long way to dealing with the Iranian-Saudi uh, <coughs> rivalry, which is lying at the heart of it and part of what is driving it forward. Then there are the civil wars. Um, I know, you know, every newspaper article you read, it's kind of, kind of common wisdom that you can't solve somebody else's civil war. I'm not going to use the term that, uh, that actually comes to mind. I'm simply going to say that is nonsense. And again, we've got this superb body of scholarly work on civil wars. And what it demonstrates is that of the civil wars that have broken out since 1989, 40% of them were solved, were ended prematurely, that is short of any kind of a term, natural terminating point. Natural terminating points in civil wars can take 50 years, right? Look at Colombia. Right? But they've been solved by third party negotiation. Right? The world is actually getting better at how you solve a civil war. We actually know more or less what you have to do to actually make it happen. And it's not quick, it's not, well, it actually is relatively quick, but it's not really quick, and it's not fun, and it's not cost-free, but it's eminently doable if you do the right thing. Right? And then there's the last piece, the failure of the Arab state system, where again I'll come back to what the Saudis are doing. Right? The answer to that is reform. Right? What we've seen, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, is where they are headed, right, they've got a choice, either repression or revolution. Right? And those things, are, unfortunately, are not mutually exclusive. Right? 
long-term repression can just make the revolution that much more worse when it comes, right? There is a third path, right? The path of reform. That's the right path. And for the first time now, we actually have a Saudi king, well, crown prince, but soon to be king, right, who gets this. Uh, in 2004, I think it was, I first started writing about the importance of reform in the Arab world. In 2008, I wrote a book on the subject, laying out the importance of reform, why it was needed, how you do it, what the U.S. role should be, ba 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 um, And I had a whole chapter in there about how to deal with the Saudis. Because everybody who read I sent around to all kinds of people to get their comments, and they all kept coming back to me and saying, you got to deal with the Saudis, right? Because the Saudis have no interest in reform. And as long as the Saudis have no interest in reform, it's going to be really hard to get any traction for reform in the Arab world. And I had a whole chapter trying to explain it. Honestly, the, the chapter was weak, right? Because there was so little that you could do with a Saudi government that just had no interest in reform. We're in a completely different place now. Right? I'd love to write that book now, right? Because that chapter on Saudi could be, you know, gangbusters. Well, it's, you know, really short. The Saudi king wants to do reform. All we should do is help him. Right? Now, helping him actually requires a lot, but nevertheless, it puts us in a position where we've never been before. Right? And if the Saudis can do it, and if the Saudis are willing to push it, then there's reason to believe that other countries too. But as I said, it's probably not the kind of thing that we can just sit back and say, you know, go for it, boys, you're finally doing the right thing. Because right? as I said at the beginning of my talk, reform is a difficult thing. And even really smart people have gotten it wrong. I mean, I'm old enough, and I think there's some others in the room who are old enough to remember, in 1989, sorry, 1991, when the Soviet Union fell, right, and Jeffrey Sachs packed up his uh, duffel bag full of papers and went over to Eastern Europe to try to teach them how to do post-Soviet, post-totalitarian reconstruction, right? And Jeffrey Sachs is a really smart guy. And at the time, everyone thought that his ideas were really smart, were really smart ways for these post-Soviet countries to go about reform. And his ideas mostly failed, right? And they didn't fail because they weren't smart. They failed because this is really hard to do, right? And the successful cases of meaningful reform, meaningful transformation that you find historically, typically it's kind of a long trial and error process with people trying different things and finding out this doesn't work, that does, so double down on that, stop doing this, and try something new. Right? And on top of that, the more that these other problems burn, the more that the civil wars are out there, the more that the Sunni-Shia conflict is left to burn, and the more that the United States absents itself from the region so it doesn't deal with these problems, the harder it is for the Saudis or anybody else to actually to undertake meaningful reform. Because all of these other problems are going to create threats. And what we've seen time and again is faced with those threats, the governments react to them, and they put reform on the back burner. Right? We don't need that. It's a moment when we actually can have meaningful reform. We need it. They need it. We shouldn't lose this opportunity. So let me stop there, and I said I'll open it up to anything you guys want to talk about. <laughs>